Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036 0703 7681198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Our Father, we lift up our hearts to you because you are God who never fails and because when you speak your word, you watch over your word to bring it to pass. Because you are spoken to us, you are spoken concerning us, you are spoken your great purpose for our lives, we are putting our hands in your hand this night. That which it takes for a man to walk through divine open doors, release it to us. Amen. To walk into doors, doors that you yourself have set open, show us how to walk into those doors in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Begin, Lord, to instruct us by your spirit and in your wisdom how to work into doors that heaven has opened. Lord, we are trusting that these days that you have been speaking to us of greater things, greater tasks, and you are now saying for that greater things to happen, I am setting a door before you. We ask Father that since you will not shut that door and you say no man can shut it, all that remains is how to move into it, please instruct us in the name of Jesus Christ. Enlarge our heart, enlarge our understanding and give us revelation of what we must rise to do from this meeting. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. We started to look at the vision that God is setting before us and how he is speaking into our lives particularly for this purpose. We had only spent time looking at the God who has spoken. The God who had spoken. God took the time to introduce himself to us. He took the time to introduce who he is. Whether we were in Isaiah 45 or we were in Revelation chapter 3, we saw that the first paramount thing God was doing was to introduce himself. Say, I am God. There is none else. I am the Lord. There is none beside me. We saw that it was very important and very crucial because only those who do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Many, many times, he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge because they did not know me. They do not know the capacity of him that is speaking. He said, my people, they have left me and they have turned to vanity. They have left the source of living water and they are going about digging broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And all of this because they don't know me. 
when Jesus encountered that woman at the well, the first thing Jesus said to her, when he said, give me a drink, and the woman started talking about, he said, if you have known the gift of God, and if you have known who it is that is speaking to you, you will have simply asked me to give you water. And you know, because of lack of knowledge of him who was speaking to her, she went about parabolating and saying all kind of things that does not matter. Because that was the point of her visitation. That was the point God had come down to encounter her. And there was actually no reason why Jesus had to pass through that road except to encounter her. But Jesus being patient, he patiently spoke and spoke until the woman recognized who he was. And you will know that the point at which our turning point came was when her eyes opened. Say, our father said, a Messiah will come. And Jesus said, I will speaking to you. I am he. Now we spent most of the time not yet speaking about what are the declarations that God had made. We felt it was very important, crucial to look at the God who has spoken. And as I was looking at the God who has spoken, it was looking like we should just have continued because I just realized that the more you get to know him, the more your faith will rise in him, isn't it? The more you know who is speaking to you, the more you can deliberately cast your life, cast your care, cast everything about you onto him because you know Brother Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I know that what I have committed to his hands, he is able to do what? To keep it. Not for two years, not for three years. He is able to keep it until the very end. Say, I know him whom I have believed. And the greatest cry, the greatest prayer that you see with Paul all the time, he said, that I may know him. Jesus himself, knowing him is eternal life. When a man has not begun to know him with speaking, you might take God's word for granted. So settled on the fact that the one who speaks to us is the one who is holy. As I said yesterday that he is holy. There is no iota of corruption or wrong motive or ill motive in whatever he says. What he does not intend to do, he will never say it. What he is not willing to carry out on your behalf, God will never declare it. Whatever God declares, God is righteous and faithful to watch over his word to bring it to pass. With our God, it is not yes and no. If God says yes, when will it be yes? Forever yes. God can never swallow his word. And if he says no, it is always no because his no is no. And his yes is yes. So from that point, I'd like to invite you. I'm inviting you deliberately to join me in understanding what he who cannot fail is saying. Now, I ask you to join me because, number one, I notice that what God is saying, he's saying to me and he's saying to you. Hallelujah. And I just know that when God comes to make a declaration like that, and he has spoken into my own heart, into my own spirit, I just know that he is committed to bring it to pass. I know he is mobilized. He has mobilized himself to bring his word to pass. 
And we did say yesterday, and I want to repeat again, that whatever God says, you don't need to think or calculate how God will carry it out. That is none of your business. The reason is because God can never be incapacitated. God can never be hindered. God can never lack what it takes to vindicate himself and to vindicate his promises. Even if everything will have to be at a standstill for God to be true, God will be true. Romans chapter 3 says, let God be true and let all men be what? Liars. What does that mean? For God to prove true because God can never lie. God cannot do anything that will make him appear as if he has told a lie to you or he has said something that he could not do and because he had made a bogus promise and he did not know how to handle it, he's trying to wriggle himself out of it or he's trying to change the rule of the game. Now, everything it will cost for God to bring his word to pass, he is ready to meet it. Please come with me. Because what I'm concerned about as part of our envisioning is to have a clear understanding of what God says he will do. We will spend a bit of time to understand what is the dimension of what God has said. What does that imply? What's the implication of it for you as a person? For me as a person? What is the implication of it for us as a people? What is the implication of us of that for us as we serve God together? And what is the implication of that for us in Peace House and in Boko particularly? Each of these things has direct implication. And the one I could undo tonight, we will try. I will first start with you as an individual, how does that, what does that imply for you? Then I trust God, I'll go ahead. What does that imply for this land? What does it imply for the work to which God has called us? What does it imply for the vision that God had given us about a global move of God? And what does that imply even for Boko, for Benue State? where we are located. And because I am aware that we have brothers and sisters who have come from other nations, can I quickly advise you, even when you hear me talk of Goko, are you hearing me? Make sure you plug your country into it. Are you, are you hearing me? Uh, either from Malawi or from South Africa or from uh, Cote d'Ivoire or from Conakry, or anywhere, wherever you are. Make sure you plug in the things that God is saying, and it is landing on your spirit. Plug yourself into it. Never you zone yourself out of what God is talking about. Hallelujah. Don't say, well, he's talking to some people there. It might be you that the Holy Spirit is addressing. Make sure you key yourself into what the Spirit of God is saying. We are going to concentrate on the Revelation passage, chapter 3. And we are going to concentrate on verse 8. But in order for completeness of the thought that was in that message, we are going to read again from verse 7 and we will get as far as verse 12 but I will simply be focusing on that verse 8 because that's where we are going to be dealing with what is the implication of what God is saying to you, to me to us as a people to our land and to wherever you represent praise the Lord so, if you open your Bibles, 
you will please follow me to the Revelations chapter 3. And I'm reading verse 7. I'll read it up to verse 12. May God help us in the name of Jesus. This thing says he who is holy. He who is true. He who has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts. And shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. And I've kept my word. And I've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and they are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial. Which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. That no one may take your crown. He who overcomes. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name. I want to stop at that point. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, you will notice that while we picked this message that God sent to us, we were picking it along with, with Isaiah 45, where God was saying, I will open double doors unto him, and I will hold his hand to subdue nations. So, why we are going to be, you know, moving in between these two passages, we are only going to be dealing with understanding what does God say he wants to do. So, can I begin with you from verse 8? Are you ready now? Now, when I got to verse 8, the first challenge that came to me, and I want to show you, when he said, I know your works. My first challenge is does God recognize little, little services? Does God take notice and take cognizance of my contribution to his kingdom? Does God pay attention to what appears insignificant that I may have contributed to his kingdom? As for God to be now speaking, I know your works. That's the first thing that I want you to mark. God is not unfaithful to forget your labor of love. Do you remember a passage like that? Hebrews chapter 6, I suppose verse 10. What did he say? For God is not unrighteous 
To do what? To forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and you do minister. God is not unrighteous. I love the way the word of God put it. Which means it is unrighteousness for someone to forget those who labored. Those who did something. Those who contributed. Those who laid down their lives. Those who made sacrifices towards his name. Those who were digging. Who were digging the pits, the pit latrine. Just to host people for God. I'm hearing God saying, God is not unrighteous. To do what? To forget your labor of love. And to forget the works you have done towards his name. That's the first thing that struck me as I am beginning to respond to this passage. And that to me is the first instruction that I wish to lay before you so that we can move on. Can I tell you that God does not forget what you did? Eh? I remember that Jesus, when the disciples had been with him, when he was about to go, I think in Luke chapter 22, verse 27 and 28, he said, you are there. Can you read that? Just, just read all of that because I'm establishing one matter before I go to where we are going. Luke chapter 22. And verse 28. Uh, is anybody there already? You are there? Which have continued with me in my temptations. Which means Jesus never forgets those who tarried with him. Those who did not run away. Those who did not chicken out. Those who persevered in what God was speaking about and was doing. Go on reading, brother. You are there. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed to me. Yes. That they may eat and drink at my table. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. In my kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, what is Jesus saying there? He said, you, you, you have been with me. I can never forget that you are the one who tarried with me in my trials. I can never forget that you are those who stayed with me when there was nothing. I can never forget that you are those who persevered all through the trying, the trying times of my life. And I will not let you, I will not, I will not forget you. I appoint unto you a kingdom, even as my fathers appointed to me, that you may come and sit and eat and drink in my kingdom, and you will rule and sit on the twelve thrones of Israel. What does that mean? What is the principle that God is dealing with? And if I were going to be very, very faithful to you, I want you to know that this passage, even though it has implication for many people that are hearing us and all of that, but I think it has a particular implication for those of you that are in Boko. I perceive that God is beginning to say, I know what you have done. I know your work. I know those of you that just for identifying with what God is talking about, you've suffered persecution. You've been blacklisted. You have been blackmailed. And it is out of 
you know, your commitment that you have not given up. And it is out of your conviction that this is the word of God that you have stayed. And you see, as I was looking at that scripture, because as far as I'm concerned, even though many people will be blessed with this, but I knew God was speaking directly to us here. God is saying, I know your work. I know what you did. Do you think God will forget that where we are sitting here today, there are people sitting here who when we came here and there was nothing, it was a pure bush and we started cutting the grass. This terracing that you are sitting and the thing, you know that we did not get any special man to do it. We dug it. We were all working here. We were all carrying the, the wheelbarrow and we were all digging and some of us, our, our palms were, were actually scattered. And I'm hearing God say, I know your works. The time for me to respond to you has come. The time for me to begin to fulfill in response to what you have done has come. And so the first thing that I was deeply, deeply overwhelmed as I hear God declaring that scripture was that, so God never forgets. So God remembers. So God will not be unrighteous to overlook you. Which means God is committed not to just put you aside because many more people have come. Which means God is saying, you are they who have been with me, who have continued with me, who have persevered with me all the days of my trials. There are people that have come in the days of my enjoyment. I hope you know there are some like that. That they came when everything is settled. They came when it is wonderful to identify. They came when it was, when it was honorable to say, I belong to that work. Why God is not going to go without blessing them. Hallelujah. But God is talking about something. I know your works. Even people like us may have forgotten what you did, but he never forgets. Even recent brothers might be operating as if, as if they are the timber and the caliber of the work of God. And they may even carelessly push you aside and say, go away, what are you doing? You are an old fashioned, old prophet. Never let that affect you. Because him for whom you labor said, I know your works. I never forget. I'm hearing God saying, I never forget. And that's why I feel that whatever God is going to do all over the world, no matter how many thousands and millions of people, this move, this stream is going to affect he will never forget where it began from. And that's why it is critical that you will understand that when God is speaking, he's speaking particularly. And he's speaking peculiarly. And he's speaking deliberately. I know your works. I know what you have done. I know how you have served me. But you know this morning as I was looking at that passage, I was overwhelmed. I said, God, which work have I really done that you are claiming that you know? 
everything I've done, is it not you who did it in me? Is it not you who gave the grace? Is it not you who walked in us, both to we and of your good pleasure? As I was saying, Lord, you know, it's all your work. You couldn't be saying you know my work because I did nothing. And you know, with a very deep sense, as if I'm hearing God saying, even that you allowed me to use your carcass, I will still not go without rewarding you for that. Even though I'm the one who did the work in you, but that you gave me space. That you allowed me to sit in you and walk in you to do what I did. I will never forget that it was your vessel I used. Is anybody hearing me here? That God is saying, I know what you have done. I know your contributions. I know your labor. I know your sweat. I know I cannot forget what you did for me. Why is God saying this? He was telling even the disciples and said, you have been with me. You are the ones who tarried with me in the days of my trial. When I had nowhere to lay my head, you were there with me. When they were throwing stones at me, you were there with me. When everything is looking tough as if I missed it, you were with me. When everybody thought that you are a demon, you are a baseball, you were there. I know your works. Now, what is the implication of that for you? First, I want you to know that if you did anything genuinely for God in this work, there's a reward for you. There's a day of remembrance. If you gave a cup of cold water to somebody, he said you will not miss that reward. So can God remember a cup of cold water? Can God remember those who gave us uh, the plot of 50 by 100? Who came and said, sir, we, we, we said we need an office, but we have not got one. We have been looking. I have this plot. Can you use it? He said, i never forget that. I know your works. So the first implication is, can I say to you that whatever you have done for God before now, no matter how tiny, insignificant it appears, whether it is mentioned on the pulpit or it was never mentioned, can I say to you, don't give up. Because him to whom you did it, we never forget. And a day of reward is coming. A day when God will say, I remember the sacrifice. And I remember her offerings. And I remember her tears. And I remember her prayers. Time has come now to give her a space in what I'm about to do. That's the first point. I know your works. What is the second implication of that? I know your works. Which means even what you are doing presently. Hallelujah. There's a future for it. Even your present contribution to the purpose of God. Even your contribution to, to laboring. Even your, your availability. I don't know how to put that. Sometimes, some are just laboring inside that kitchen and they never even got to hear any meeting. Does God forget? He said, I know your work. And I'm imagining some of you say, ah, this thing that God is saying, it cannot be about me. What do I know? What have I done? It's for the big, big men. Stop, stop talking like that. So that you can understand how to walk into what God is saying. Hallelujah. 
What did he say? I know your works. I said the second implication is that if God knows what I'm doing, I better do it well. Did you understand that? If God one day will wake up and say, I know what you did in peace house. Now it is pay time. Now it is the pay time, pay day. Now is the time for me to respond to all those things that you are doing. All those quiet work you are doing. All those unmentionable work that you did. All those things that nobody gets to talk about. I know your works. And you know why this is very critical for me, particularly because of this work that we are doing. Can I tell you why? This is a work where for all the years that God taught us, our understanding is no show, no ostentation. No show, no ostentation. Christ, none but Christ, the Gadra of the spoil. Because of our understanding, there is not I but Christ. Many of you did things that nobody came to appreciate. If it is somewhere else, they will have given a clap offering for what you did. Isn't it? They will have said, somebody did something like this. Let's jam our hands together and give a clap offering to him. But in our mind, in our understanding, we keep hearing Jesus say, and he has received his reward. That's why we have not been doing it. That's why it will appear as, yeah, look at this, mama. He has done this, he has done this, and he never called her off to say, okay, let us honor. What kind of place is this now? Some people got annoyed because when they come here, they are very, they think that they are big, and I should have stood up and said, let us recognize. So, so, and so, and so, and so, and so. They are the people that are the chief movers. When I was stranded, they were the ones that sent uh, so much. Please recognize, give honor to whom honor is due. And then we clap hands and say, please give him a special seat. And then in peace house, we are going to make him a chairman or something. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have not been so taught. So it will look as if nobody recognizes you. So it means a lot to me when I hear God saying, I know your work. It touched my heart that, ah! So even though it will appear as if they don't recognize people here, they don't appreciate people here, they don't clap hands for people here, they don't uh, uh, analyze what people have done. Nobody is told that somebody brought this money, somebody brought that cow, somebody brought this one. And we just keep quiet. To such a point that some people are imagining, there's no hope in that place. There's no hope for promotion in that place. If you are doing this kind of work, nobody will remember you. This is how you'll be laboring and nobody will make you anything. I just went to that other ministry and just one month, when they recognize what I'm doing, they appreciate people in that place. They have already made me an assistant pastor. But here, you study Bible, study Bible, study Bible, study Bible, study Bible, study Bible. That's all. Whatever you did, they will not even mention it. I go to where I can be recognized quickly. And it takes the word of God for you to tarry here, isn't it? It takes a deliberate understanding that it's not I, it's not about self, it's about him. But now I'm hearing God say, I know your work. If he will not forget, how should I do that work? I will do it more conscientiously. I will do it with all my diligence. I will do it with all my heart. And that's what I'm saying to myself. I say, God, if you can remember 
minutest work. If you will remember that this brother was the one who stood for hours behind the camera. And that a day is coming when you say, now I'm going to set a door before you. Then Lord, help me to serve you with all my heart. That's the first implication for me. So I felt, uh -huh. so even nobody knows, he knows. And even if nobody talks about it, he will one of these days announce it. And if nobody cares to reward me with a clap offering or with a special appointment, one of these days, he will appoint me. He said, I appoint you a kingdom as my father has done what? Appointed me. Do you think I can go on now? Eh? Are you settled? Do you think this message concerns you? Eh? Does he have a direct relevance to those of us sitting here? It does. It does. So whether you are the one who dug to plant this pole, and I cannot remember, I cannot forget how we went cutting poles until snake chased us out of that forest. We were felling one of the beam and a snake went and beat a brother Charles and that's how we all ran out. But that didn't stop us. We were still going to cut more poles. That will not stop us. We are still going to dig. We are still going to do whatever we can. Because we believed that this thing, there's something there. Praise the Lord. Because we know that something there, something is there. And if we did not, if we did not give up one of these days, he will reward it. Now, I want to now begin to say to you, the time when God will begin to remember you has arrived. It will be in degrees. It will be at various levels. It will be in various dimensions. But I want you to know that from now on, a remembrance concerning your life, concerning your secret labor, concerning your services to him, is going to begin. So I want you to know that even though what we did, it was him who did it in us, and we never will claim merit for what he did in us. But he himself, out of his benevolence, out of his righteousness, he said, I know your works. I know you have served me. I know you have labored. I know you have put your hand in this matter. And there are some that they, they threw their life here when they were young. And they are now getting old and they have not left. And some people are saying, this thing, this thing, what are you getting out of it? The time has come when God, who never forgets, will begin to remember you and do for you what no man can do in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the next issue? I took time to talk about that because that's the first word that I saw the Lord bringing divine acknowledgement. Divine acknowledgement. Human acknowledgement will have been something. But when it is God now bringing a divine acknowledgement, say, I know your works. I wish the Holy Spirit will register it somewhere in your heart. 
And if ever any one of you look discouraged and say, well, this thing, this thing, nobody even knows I'm there. He knows. The most important person who ought to know said, I know. Praise the Lord. All others that you are thinking they should know. <laughs> Let me tell you. What would they do? They either sympathize with you and say, hey, yeah. And what does their sympathy do to you? Nothing. Or some will say, God, even though nobody recognizes you, we recognize you. What does that do for you? Nothing. And if somebody just can't say, okay, you know, I tell you a story that pained me some years ago. I have been ministering to this particular group of people for several years. I would travel to them. I would spend time with them. I will preach the word of God to them. So they wanted to do their 20 years anniversary. And they invited me. I thought they just wanted me to come and preach. So on that day when we got there, they did a big dinner. And they were announcing. They had all of this. They were doing that. They said, well, there's one man. Whom we cannot tell our story finished without mentioning him. So I was busy looking for the man. So they talked, ran, 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 ran. Then they landed on Brother Gbile. They finished my joy that day. You know what they did? They called me forward. They said, so we therefore now want to recognize him and honor him and reward him. So I was still wondering. So they went and brought a... Uh, Crozet, you call it. That thing they use with tissue paper <laughs> of different color that they tie around and they put it on my neck. And they brought me one wood which they call a plaque. And they're placing and immediately I don't know how the spirit just brought a passage there and they have received their reward. Without thinking, I removed that thing and tore it and dropped on the ground. And then the people said, we told you, but I really doesn't like this kind of thing. <laughs> eh? You have disturbed him now. So they came back and said, sorry, we are very sorry. We know you don't like this kind of thing. We are very sorry. We just thought at least for once, we should show our appreciation. I said, for what? I said, Kai, you have really, really put me into trouble today. They said, we know. We know you don't like it. But we just like I said, why do you do it? So I told God, I said, God, you know, I have not received this in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have rejected this in. Oh, let it not go on record that I have received my reward. Oh. <laughs> But you see, the world system, they don't know what to do. They think it is not good for them not to recognize and reward a man who has labored with them for 20 years. But that's not the kind of reward. When God says, I know your work, what he will do for you will not be an ordinary thing. He's taking you to something big. That's where we are going tonight. So, can you now follow me reading? Now say, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. Before I come to speak about that door, there was a because that you will see in that line. Have you seen the word because? Eh? You may not know that it is because. They use the word for. Did you say for? For you have a little strength. Oh my God, you didn't see it. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. And you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Did you see that now? Now, the word for. 
because you have a little strength, you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Permit me to note with you now that the door that God is going to set for you before you is not because you are strong. It's not because you are mighty. It's not because you have strong muscles. That was not what God was looking at for setting before you an open door. God was not setting before you this open door because you have great strength. No. It is not because you are mighty. No. And I want to tell you, it is also not because you have grown big. No. This door that God is setting before you is despite your strength. It is despite your personality. It is despite your capacity. It is not because you have something with which you say yes, no. So, may I say to you that the door that God is talking about is not commensurate with your strength. It's not commensurate with your experience. It is not commensurate with your power. So my first request, as we seek to understand what God is saying he wants you to do, I want you to know that it is not because of your strength. So whether you are strong or you are weak does not have anything to do with what God is about to do now. In fact, the weaker you are, the better. The little strength you have, the better for us. The weaker you are, the more the power of God will be made perfect. While I want to note with you that you might be thinking, but I have little strength, but I don't know so much, but I am not very this, I'm not very that. Let God wait until I grow bigger. May I inform you that the very thing that is attracting God to you is your little strength. I don't know. I pray that this will be clear to you. Can I explain it a little further? I have known over the years, particularly when God began to tell us about what he wanted to do with our lives. God brought a matter that I have not been able to, to, to finish studying for the past is going to 40 years now. And what was that? God said, I have no pleasure in the strength of a horse. I have no pleasure in the legs of a man. I am only attracted to weak people. I only do my greatest work with weak people. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who know that they are spiritually poor, they are the ones that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And it is coming back to me again as we are entering to this decade of greater things. You know in my mind when God said I have a greater task for you. I was thinking then I need a greater what? Power. Greater strength. Greater this. Only for God to say and this greater works is only for the weakest man. 
These greater things I want to do will only be done when I see how helplessly weak you are becoming. He sent me back to what God kept saying to me. You will have heard me speak over and over again that I am an object of mercy. You will have asked me, say over and again, that I want to be in the intensive care unit of God's mercy. I want to be so weakened and crippled that God will only look at me and the only thing that will come out of him is his mercy for my life. When God announced this work that he wanted to do with us several years ago, and I was saying, God, give me power to do it. God said, no, you don't need power. You need mercy. And because I didn't understand, he said, go. You know, when you read Matthew 9, he said, go and ask what it means when I say I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I said, Lord, we are saying I should go and, I should go and learn that. Where? Wouldn't you teach me what it means? And I remember he brought another pastor. He said, the battle is not to the strong. The race is not to the sweet. Intelligent people don't always make it to the top. I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Even at this point when God is talking about a great open door that I know will soon come, it will still be coming because of my little strength. It will still come because I am helplessly dependent on him. It will still come because I have no muscle to pull. And just when I thought one can graduate from this matter of waiting for God's mercy, just when I thought that after many years of experience, God should be talking about expertise. But God is saying, no. Experts have nothing to do in my work. My power is only made perfect in your weakness. And I'm praying because I know even some of the brothers, they may be wondering, say, by this time we should have been made, we perfected in everything, we should have been able to do everything correctly, perfectly. Not knowing that me, I'm always praying that, Lord, if I'm becoming too strong, please scatter me. Because what qualifies me for this open door God is talking about is what? Your little strength, your weakness. How will I be able to convey that to you? that what is going to happen in this year and in the years ahead of us will be so overwhelmingly large. But it will be because we have grown how? Weaker and weaker and weaker because God's power will only show up best when he sees that you are weak. And maybe you have heard God say, I've set an open door for you. Even you, my brother, you are hearing. And it is true. And I know God will do it. But it will be because. What? You have a little strength. But you see, 
This is what is generally contrary. This is what my friends and colleagues cannot understand. They want to be strong. They want to be powerful. They want to throw their hand like this and people say, yes, the powerful man of God has come. But I hear God saying, but that's not what I want. I want a weak man. I want a man who cannot lift a finger so that I can be the one that holds his hand. The other day, one sister was teaching us something about, about swimming and about helping people that are drowning. And when she said it, the only thing I heard when she finished, God said, did you hear again? She said, when you are swimming, even if your husband is there and your husband is, is, is drowning, huh? said, don't rush to help him. Ah! My husband, my wife is drowning. I should not rush to help him. He said, no. She said, as long as she still has strength. If you are trying to pull him, when he grabs you with all his strength, what will happen? It will sink. It will sink the two of you and the two of you will perish. I said, so when should you help him? He said, when he has become completely helpless. When there is no particular strength for him again. That even if you just go and you just use one corner of your hand to be pushing him like this. <laughs> Are you understanding? You will push him to safety. A strong man is not helpable. Those who are strong in themselves cannot see the glory of God to the extent to which God wants to go with us. Those who have, you know, the tensile strength of their muscles and they can stand on their own, they will not see this thing that God wants to do. And I'm afraid to share with you again, brothers, that now that God said, I know your work. I know you have little strength and I'm opening a great door to you. How am I going to maintain this open door? I'm here going to talk about what that open door will do. But let me tell you, the key to where we're about to enter is in our weakness. Great things is going to come to this peace house. Some people already thought that we have become great. We have not. Oh. What God is speaking about, we render everything we have done up to this time to be almost nothing. But what is the key to it? Our weakness. Our little strength. Our helplessness. Our complete, complete dependence. Because we have no other strength to exercise. When you come to the end of yourself, then the Lord Almighty, he will step in. So when that sister said, don't rush to help him. Wait until he is tired. Wait until he is exhausted. Wait until he has drank some bowls of water into his stomach. At that time, even if you just stretch one finger and you're using it like this, 
you will help him. And even though it looked like it looked like uh, something, me, I sat in that class and they used to say, is that not what I've been telling you? Some people have a wrong theology that I don't know where they got it. Can I read it to you? I do, it's not in Bible. I do, I've been reading my Bible. I've never seen it. They say heaven helps those who help themselves. <laughs> eh? Is there any Bible verse where you have found that? I've been reading Bible all the years. I've never found one of it. What I don't know is has entered the theology of many people. Now they say even if God is going to walk, do something. Show God that you can do something first. It is what you do, then God will add. I hear such sermons that is not in the word of God. But I want to tell you something. I want to confess to you this moment. Because I see that we have come to a junction. Emmanuel, I want you to hear me very well. Those of you that have company with me for all the years, you know. You know this. You know that we have never, never done anything we did by the strength of man. You know very well that everything that we have now seen, none of us can claim that it came by our strength. Isn't it? But God is now coming again. He said, all that I have done with you, I've done through you, I've done in your hand. As wonderful as it may appear, I have a greater thing for you. But now as I was beginning to say, Lord, how are we moving into these greater things? How are we moving into these open doors? How are we moving to this enlargement? Again, he said, because you have little strength. When I thought this is the time to mobilize, say those of you that are not strong, Get yourself, get yourself, do something. He said, no, I've never asked you to be strong. I've always asked you to be strong in the grace that is in the Christ Jesus. Have you read your Bible before? Be strong, not in yourself. How are you going to be strong? In the grace. And if a man is going to be strong in the grace... It means it's going to be the weakest for grace to be strong in his life. It was as we were in the Republic of Benin the other time and were doing the, the MLR for the, for the Francophone nations. And they have come in their own thousands. And we were talking about the rod of his strength. The rod that God will use to subdue his enemy. And as I was about study, what is the rod of his strength? The first thing I heard is that it's not, he didn't say strong rods. What did he say? The rod of his strength. Not my strength, his I said, ah, God, what are you talking about? And he says, such people that will become rod of my strength, there's something about them. There's something about them. They are people who are deepened completely in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Even as I'm talking to you now, I have no doubt, brothers and sisters, I have no doubt that we are at the threshold of a great move of God. I have no doubt that nations, nations, nations from all over, the Lord will cause this work to be penetrating and affecting them so effectively and powerfully. But it will come through men and women who are weak. 
so that the grace of God can be released. So that the power of God can be made perfect. You know, I wish this is not the thing I should be telling you. I wish what I'd be telling you is that, brothers, we are now at the beginning of great work. Gather yourself. Do something. I wish that's what I'm saying. But God said that's not the way forward. How many of you would like to see the glory of God in the land of the living? You would like to see the glory of God. Praise the Lord. You will see it. God will show you his glory. But it will be in your weakness. It will be with your little strength. It will be with your absolute dependence on God. I will tell you, do you know that we spend millions? Eh? Do you know that we spend millions to do the meetings and the work that God has called us to do? Do you know that? Do you know that we are building and it's in millions. And yet, how could that be? When sometime, when I asked, I said, this building we are going to start now, they, they bring me a budget and say, we need 20 something million to, to do it. And I said, uh, sister, what do we have in the account? And she said, uh, as of now, we have 1,500 naira. I said, but God, why? Why do you do that to me? And I've already allocated the unbuilt buildings where people will sleep. And some people come and say, sir, why do you also always do this kind of thing? You know we are going to do this thing since uh, January. How, why can't we? Uh, and I will be laughing. I say, he doesn't know. He doesn't know that there's nothing. He doesn't know that we are helpless. And as we begin to cry to God in our helplessness, you see God showing forth his power. You see God doing something. I say, ah, is this how you work? So when uh, Levi, when you started learning that, I said, now you are going to be great. You are going to see great things. If God is able to dismantle your strength and empty you of self-energy, nobody, there's no limit to which God cannot go with you. And I realize that my strength, my wisdom, my capacity is my pitfall. Where I thought I was a strong man, that's where Satan has gained the ground. And when I came on this again, I just, I don't know what to do than to fall before God again. I say, now Lord, since you say you will do this, this kind of open door that is going to come, please Lord, make me ready for it. And make me ready for it simply means evacuate my strength. Cripple me again. Make me weak so that your power can find a space to manifest. All my children in the faith all those that want to start ministry and they come to me and say, sir, God is calling us. When they are finished telling me everything they know, sometimes when I want to be very, very open to them, I just bring my note. I say, can I read this thing to you? They say, we came for you to, 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 to slam our lives with anointing. I say, hmm, it's good. 
I wish I can slam you like that. But can I show you what will make you great? They say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I say, you need mercy. It's not of him that runneth. It's not of him that willeth. It's God that showeth mercy. Those that are energetic, they will run away. They say there's no power in that place. They say there's nothing there. Uncle just like people to be crying. <laughs> and I laugh at them. I say, but where are you going? Where are you going when God has not carried you? What do you hope to become when the mighty hand of God has not uphold you? How are you expecting to subdue nations when it is not God himself doing his work through you? This night, my brothers, I have no doubt, and I want to tell you, there is no doubt that God's word will come to pass. There's no doubt. But just at this point, and God is saying, behold, I set before you an open door. Only for God to say, but the way into this open door, the way to this elaborate door that I'm going to set for you, is it the way of little strength? Is it the way of brokenness? Is it the way of self empty? That God might do it. There are some of you that have struggled to, to, to make it in ministry. The only time that you became dead and you surrender and say, God, I no longer care whether I fail or I succeed, but just do your will. They do notice that that's the moment that something changed. Have you noticed that? But you know the problem is that once God moved and something began to happen, are you hearing me? You woke up. Say, sir, thank you. I know how to do it now. And you took over. You took over. And the moment you took over, you stagnate. God may not remove what he has given you. But since you have taken over, you will not get more. So you only now begin to become a maintenance officer of what has already expired. Me, I want to pray again. I say, Lord, I'm believing what you have said. But I've seen the key. How do I walk into this open door? A man with little strength. A man with broken bones. A man with nothing to boast. Now, when I say like that, am I talking of a lazy man? No. One of the things I knew about lazy men, that lazy men, oh my God, if you hear them talking, bogus things, a lazy man will be beating his chest. I'm not talking of such people. This thing I'm dealing with will make you tremble. You will tremble before God. You will cry. You know that what God is about to do, if he does not help you, you cannot make it. So can I now introduce you to the open doors. Do you think I can start now talking about what is the dimension of open doors? Let me do that. Wherever I stop on that, we can then go to God together in prayer. But I'm hoping that you are catching the critical issues here. Go back with me now to verse 8. I know your works. 
See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. What is an open door? Open door first implies unlimited access. What do I call it? Unlimited access. You see, when a door is open, what it means that you can come in. There's an access to come in. But when the door is closed, it means you are not wanted inside. And you may be knocking and banging and banging and if they don't want you to come in, will they open the door for you? No. But when God said, I have set before you an open door, the first thing I'm saying is that there is going to be unlimited access access. You know, you go and read Second Peter chapter 1. He said, if you do these things, so will God minister to you an entry into the kingdom. You come across that scripture in chapter 1 of Second Peter. I think verse 10 down to verse 11. What does that imply? The first implication of open door is unlimited access. Take note that I did not talk about assets. Excuse me. Assets requires closed door. Do you get me? If there is a plenty <laughs> something here that is very costly. What do you do? You lock the door. Wherever people focus on assets, they must close the door. Because if you don't close your door on your assets, you are finished. But it is not assets that open door is about. Open door is about what? Access. And do you know that access is more important, more costly than assets? Access is an opening into the reservoir that you may never be able to collect by yourself. So I'm hearing God saying, behold, I set before you an open door. I'm going to give you access. 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 I will connect you with where you will have all that you need to carry out my assignment on your life. Excuse me. My pocket may never swell. No, you are not hearing me at all. But I will have access to where everything I need is located. And this door that God is talking about in Isaiah 45, he said, is a two-leaved gate. It's a double door. 
such that anything you want to carry out, there is no space for you to have access to it. So when he said, I will set before you an open door that no man can shut. I said, Lord, you mean that in my littleness, with my little strength, you will be giving me access to great things. He said, yes, that's what I will be doing. Because you are part of this, and because God has mentioned your name, God has said, I know him. I know him by name. Even before he is born, I have mentioned him. I have numbered him in the register of those that will be part of this move. That's why I need to talk to you like this. If it was only for me, I know what I would have been doing. I know I would have just been rolling before God and say, oh God, this thing that you are talking about, I can know, I know it, I know it's going to happen. I know that in the course of the year, you'll be hearing how we have entered into places. And you are saying, how did Bragule get there? Open doors. And other people will be envying me. What will be their envy? They will be thinking that, ah, is he the only one? We have been working hard. We have been trying. We have been doing this. And nobody has given us that kind of privilege. Where is he getting that kind of thing? They don't understand. They don't know that it's not about trying. It's not of him that willeth. Nor of him that runneth. It's not for the intelligent. It's not for the, for the energetic. It's for those who have obtained mercy. Because they are crippled enough for God to connect them. The first implication of it, it will be access to the unlimited resources that God is been keeping in store for this purpose. I was reading a passage. I think Psalm 89, God was speaking to David. He said, the sure mercies of David I will not take away from him. He said, I have kept my mercy in store for him. It was then I said, ah, so there's a store of mercy. It means that, <laughs> that God is keeping a store of mercy and that every time I come and he saw that I need mercy, he just say, yes, in the store, the mercy that we have kept for Brother Aguilé is still there. I will not remove my mercy from him. I don't know how to tell you. I just choose under God to be an object of his mercy. People are thinking that I'm a strong man, but I never pray to be a strong man. I just want to pray to remain an object of what? Mercy. That Baba is carrying. If this work is going to go all over the globe, it will go in there by one matter. By what? By the mercy of God. Not by merit. We may spend money, but it's not money. It's the mercy of God. It's not going to be by mighty men. We don't even need to know mighty men. But God will give us access to what they are sitting upon and they will serve God's purpose under our hand. Oh my God, are you hearing me? And as it happens globally, it will happen to you at your level in the name of Jesus Christ. Since God is speaking in your ears and you are here to believe God, 
even you also. There's an open door for you. God will we begin to release divine access, unlimited access. What again will an open door be? If we have understood the matter of access, what again is an open door? An open door is a divine opening of the heavenlies for you to do what you were born to carry out in your life. And when I'm hearing God say, I've set before you an open door. Two other passages that I could not but link with it. Two other passages that I could not but link with it. Because when he said, I am the one who has the key, the keys of David, there I saw that (laughs) there are two ways in which I can have open door. It's either that It's either that the door was opened like this. Eh? And he said, this door is open. Go in. Or if the door is locked like this and I'm to be given an open door and there's nobody to open it, what is the next thing they should do? To give me the key. Oh my God. Are you following me? That's the second way by which you can have an open door. For them to do what? To give you the key. So they say, Bragbile, we lock this place because we don't want unauthorized person. But you have the key anytime you want to go in. What is that? That's an open door. So I hear Jesus say, Behold, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you lose here on earth will be loosed for you in heaven. And whatever you decide to bind or to lock up shall be locked. You have the key. That's the second way of having an open door. The keys. The keys of the kingdom. So when Jesus was speaking and said, Behold, you are Peter. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Peter may not know what that meant. But God has placed a key. Do you know that by the time Peter understood that on the day of Pentecost, everybody was talking, DJ, 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 DJ. That man just stood up. As if he has a key to open people's hearts. Eh? And he just spoke and spoke and spoke before anybody knows. The people started crying. What shall we do? What shall we do that we might be saved? What shall we do that we might be saved? And before you know it, just like this, and thousands rushed in. Thousands rushed in. He went somewhere again. Thousands rushed in. When the Gentiles were to be brought into the kingdom of God. Because up until that chapter 10, no Gentile 
has been allowed into the kingdom yet. Are you hearing me? Even though this colonial man was praying and giving alms, but the key into the kingdom of God, God has put it in somebody's hand. What did he say? Send for Peter. Do what? Send for Peter. He has the key. And as he went there, he had not finished speaking when Gentiles, the door of salvation was opened unto the Gentiles. Are we together? So when God said, I've said before you, an open door which no man can shut. It is because God was saying, I'm giving you the keys. So I say, hmm. So when God says, I'm setting before you an open door, God is giving us keys to unlock places. Things that have been under lock and key for years, God will be handing over to us to open it up. To release mysteries and provisions and the secret things of the earth to be releasing it and bringing it. I said again, the dimension of that is only as you progress with God in the course of this time that you begin to understand it better by and by. Hallelujah. So, when he said, I've said before you, a two lived gates. And I will not shut it. As I went to look at that passage, and I'm reading it along with Revelation 3, is an overwhelming issue that God is raising with us this year. What do we do with it? How do we walk through it? How does that translate onto the move of God? A mighty move that God is talking about. And I, how do I plug into what God is saying? That will be the matching order that we're expecting God to release to us. But the first thing I don't want you to forget is that God is actually going to do this not because you are strong, not because you are energetic, but because you have little, little strength. And whosoever you are, since God has said, I know, I know you. And I want you to be involved in what I'm doing. I know you have little strength. That's why I'm coming to bring you into this door. For me, my first response, I said, Lord, you have come again. You have come again, oh God. You have come to take me to what I am never qualified for. You have come again to show me what I have never, never, ever thought I could see or be involved in. There are things that has already happened here that 
Even when we tell such stories, human beings cannot understand. If I tell you one of that story, look at us here. Some years ago, we were, we were in our small meeting, staff retreat. And I think we were talking about our books. And we have gone to Makodi to print. The printing was not very good. And we struggled to go to Lagos. And we got one press that helped us to print one book. God's pattern for Christian service. The first edition. Not the one that our brothers have just reproduced during this last December. That book was printed 19... Is it 94? Or or 2000 and something. So, we were looking at, so how do we bring books out? How do we publish? How do we print books? And we were thinking, they are just lamenting. And someone said, if only we have a press. Are you hearing me? If only we have a press. And the thing just struck me. Say, but you've never asked God for a press. And I stood up with the brothers. I said, brethren, we have never asked God for a press. And the Bible said, you don't have because you never ask. I'm telling you a story because I want you to know that there are things that we saw. But God is saying all of those will be child's play compared with the door that is about to open. Are you hearing me? So we just stood and said, Father, because we need to print these books, we need to do this. Give us a press in the name of Jesus. Was our prayer more than five minutes? No. We just prayed and then we continue our meeting. And we finished this meeting around 25th or 26th of December. And we all went on break. And I think we did like we do this visions retreat. Then I was driving from my house to Peace House here. And I got to in front of Care Pharmacy. That's about the point. When the phone rang. And as the phone rang, at first I didn't want to pick it because I'm driving. But the phone was ringing persistently. So I just picked it. When I picked it, I was hearing a voice on the other side. Is that Bragbile? I said, yes. Oh, thank you, ma. How are you? So, Bragbile, we have missed you. And I said, yes. We thank God. You know, when will you come to Lagos? I said, not, not in the nearest future because we have meetings, we are doing this, we are doing this. So, okay, that's not what I call you for. I and my husband, we have been praying. And God said, we should send our prayers to Peace House. That Peace House needs the prayers. But I need to call to find out whether you have need of the press. <laughs> now, are you hearing me? This prayer we prayed around 25th of December. This call was coming around 7th of January. So, I said, oh yes ma'am. We will need we we need a press. I thought when I said we need a press, that there is one machine. Because I already sent a chance to go and look for one press me and press you press <laughs> like this. <laughs> ah, he went all the way to Ika 
to see it. And he came back and said, sir, it's good. We can print our A4 there. We just press like this and pull down. Press like this, pull down. I said, okay, let's go and see. So I thought we were going to get such a press. So he said, uh, Bragville, uh, you need to send your people to come and uh, see the place so that you can know whether you have a place where to put the press. That was when my head began to think. Say, what does it mean? What do you mean by place? When you just bring the machine and we we'll put it on one table and begin to do our work. <laughs> I did not know. You know what happened? When I sent the brothers, they went, they came back. They said, sir, the press, they said you should come and collect. It's a whole company. <laughs> All the branches of any press, standard press, the lithography, with all their photography, everything, the gluten, the binder, and then the cord machines, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one, even the one sewing machine with which if the book is big, you have a sewing machine to be sewing it. And we measure the place. The only place that can contain that press is if we either start building or since MLR has moved to the camp, can we go and adjust? So all of you look back now. Look back now. Did you see that? This used to be part of the hall here. It was the coming of the press that cut off one third of this room for that place. They did not come after two years. They came in one day. The day they brought the things, come and see. 18 different machines of different aspects was being offloaded here. I was standing there and said, my God. One five-minute prayer can bring this kind of thing here. Where are we going to get people who know how to operate this kind of thing now? The press came before we found who can operate it. The kind of thing that God, when he wants to, to work, Suddenly, we became the biggest press, not in Boko, but in Benue. So we started begging God, Lord, where do you give us? Who will run this? Who are the people? Who are the people? Send somebody to train. Somebody this, this, that, that. God went and hook one of our men. Say, go to Boko. Go and, go and throw your life into that place. You have seen this, Abby? And it's marvelous in our eyes. Then. But God is saying, where you are stepping into now, this kind of thing will become a child's play. And it will be happening, not because we have become energetic prayer warriors. It will be because you have a little strength. You are going to be hanging on the mercy of God. I know I will live to see what God is talking about. And I'm believing that you also, you will be part of that. You will not be an onlooker. You will not be saying, ah, but they said it. Oh, I thought it would never happen. I thought it would never happen. You will not be like that, other man. You will be there by yourself. You say, see, see what God has done also. 
in my life and through my life. Because this fire, we don't know where it will stop. Nobody can predict where it is going. When we sat in that night vigil the other day, memories was in my own head. What was my memory? This thing that we're talking that called crossover night vigil. We used to do it in my parlor. Five people to cross over. We will sing everything we do. We will pray into the new year. God will speak to us. And then we will write it down. And we will discuss it. And we will pray. Then Sometimes we would go. In those days when uh, Radio Benway was in Kasnala, we would go under those, there are trees. You remember? We are doing crossover. And we have been doing crossover in this place, isn't it? It came to a point where it's punishment to be forcing everybody here. Those who stand outside, they are more than those who sit inside. Some say, Brother Billy, what are we doing now? That's why we moved to the camp. And I'm watching. So is it possible that God that is saying what you have seen thus far have already happened. New things I'm declaring to you now before you spring forth I tell you of them. So my first request as I want you to stop with me here to pray is to follow me. Follow me to believe God. Eh? What did I say you should do? Follow me to believe God. Follow me to take God by his word. I want you to follow me to to enter into the purpose of God even for your own life. I want you to deliberately take a step under God and say, God, this thing that you are speaking concerning me, this thing that you are arranging with my life, and you are saying it does not depend on my experience. It does not depend on my expertise. Lord, launch me there. I want to believe you to enter there. Since it is not according to my past experience, what will stop you from coming to God? What will stop you from taking God by his word, my brother? When we talk of miracles, miracles, there are raw miracles. And there are going to be greater miracles. He said, greater works than this, I will show him. May God show you his works. So, you will, I want you to, you know I say you should follow me because me, I'm going. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Ah, yeah, yes, I am. I'm going. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to hang on his word. What I have seen has proved to me that he is trustworthy. It is, you see, we are not talking about a big thing. We are talking about the fact that God is real. He's true. What he said, when we did not even have any sign, he has done it. The kind of things that we are entering, open doors. Open doors to schools. 
open doors to ministries of education. Hey, sisters, those of you that are, are, are teachers, we will soon be carrying you up and down to come and help us. Because very soon, the whole primary schools of states will be opened. And they say, we learn that you people have a way of, of training teachers to be more effective. Can you come and train? And then we'll have to look for all of you and say, follow us. Even you yourself, you'll be talking to kings. Even yourself. Traditional rulers will be listening to you. They say, who am I? That It's not you. It's that thing that God is talking about. Open door. I can only stop at this because I told you and I'm still telling you the full dimension of what this means we will only continue to unravel it as we sit at the feet of the Lord. We can't deal with it in one meeting. As the doors are opening, you will be getting to know about it. Doors unto nations because he has the key. He has the key unto nations. It was on this altar that God said, why are you asking me for a goat? 1998. Make a bold demand. We were on this altar. I remember running from there here. And I said, God, God, I'm sorry for asking for a goat. He said, you have limited me for this number of years. Stop asking for a goat. Ask me for nations. That meeting, 98, we said, Lord, give us nations. We left the meeting here. We went and did our staff retreat in Amako Hotel. Where's Sister Comfort? Aha. You remember, she, she was my chief hostess at Marco Hotel. The whole of our staff that time, we can sit inside that uh, round, round uh, gazebo. And then that's our meeting. And several of us will check into the round rooms. Wonderful. Why can't we use Amako again? Eh? <laughs> when you see <laughs> if I ask the South Africans alone who are staff of this work to stand up they were more than who we used to be when we sit in Amako the team of men that have thrown their lives into this work they are now getting to 500 And people are saying, ah, ah, what, what is that? What is that? I said, I don't know what it is. But I'm watching that a time will come when our staff meeting will be like this. Eh? More than this. And they will be in different languages. Now, in our staff meeting, we now have to be doing translation. Because we have to speak to the French people. They have their own. They have, somebody is translating and speaking to French people. When Pakistan people come and we begin to speak Udu language to them. When <laughs> just watch. Nobody can tell where this matter is going. But some of us who have seen it from afar. But I'm hearing our God say, Behold, I set before you an open door. Will you follow me to believe God? Eh? That's what I want you to do. Let's go and believe God. I want you to confess your little strength and say, Lord, thank you. I am little. But because you are not looking for energetic man, you are not looking for the tallest of men, you are not looking for those who are 
experts. They are not looking for those who have, you know, big muscle. It's people with little strength. It means, Lord, you are thinking about me. Lord, here am I. One thing I want you to do with me, follow me to believe God. Let's believe God together. Can we believe God together? Let's pray together. Let's stand up before him. Let's say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe you. Lord, I believe you. Lord, thank you that you are not forgetting me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you never forget. Thank you that even though I look tiny, I look a man of little strength, thank you that there is a portion for me here. Thank you there is an access for me here. Thank you that what you say you will do, you are doing it. Oh God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. I want you to pray your own prayer quietly. I want to express yourself to God. I want you to say to God, I've heard you say, I know your work. That God has remembered you. That God has called you by your name. Are you one of those who used to carry the the heavy pot to cook? Were you one of those whose palm were, were burnt because of fire? And we are saying, if you die doing this, who will remember you? And God said, I know your work. Would you like to thank God that, Lord, he has not forgotten you? Can you say, Lord, so so you have not forgotten me. So there is a portion for me in what you are doing. Thank you, Lord. I first want all of you to please express your heart to God in this. There will be two prayers we are praying, but I think the first is for you to express yourself to God and say, Lord, thank you. What I've been saying, do see does he mix with faith in your heart? Are you sensing that God is speaking to you also? Can you lift up your voice and say, Lord, I'm hearing you speak. Is the thing vibrating in your soul and say, this vision, I have a portion in it. Open door to lands, open door to nations, open door even to your clan, even to your village. Open door to governments, to traditional places. Open door even to schools. Open door to different classes of women. Open doors. Open doors. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you today. Thank you for this vision. Thank you for what you are talking about. Thank you for where you are going with us. Shekori Musama. Lord, I believe. Oh God. Just feel free to pray anyhow you like. Just feel free. I sense that God is moving from road to road and is confirming to your heart and say, I know your work. 
I know you have little strength. But that's why I'm coming to you. I know how little you feel. But this is why I am turning this matter to you. I have registered you among the men and women I want to work with. Lord. Lord. Rakashakama Robosko. If this is for the timber and caliber, many of us will have been disqualified. If it is for the highly, highly placed, those who have money, those who have backbone, I will have not been part of this. If it is for the eloquent, those who can speak well, I should not have been part of this. If it is for those who know how to do publicity, those who know how to advertise, I should not have been here. Can you open your heart to God and say, Lord, you have remembered your handmaid. You have remembered your born servant. You have remembered that I've been here. I'm here. And you are saying that even in my own years, I will see your glory. You are saying that I will see your work in the midst of the years. Tonight, Lord. Thank you that I'm part of this. Thank you. Now I want to ask you to just do one thing tonight. I wish you would say, Lord, since it is not by my merit, since it is not by my strength, since it is because you are turning your eyes of mercy upon me, carry me into it. You see, when, when a man is crippled, it's a useless thing to tell him to climb. He can only be carried. Can you say, Lord, carry me into this. Let your mercy carry me into this. If you wait for me to trek into it, I will never arrive. If you wait for me to run with my feet into it, I will never get there. If it depends on me to get this done, it will never be done. But I'm hearing you say, because you have little strength, I have set before you an open door and no man will shut it. No power of hell will shut it. Lord, carry me into it, Lord. My brother, I want you to believe God with me. Just believe God. You will see the dimension in your own house. You will see the dimension of it in your family. You will see it in your ministry. You will see it in your church. The work to which God has called you, you will see it there. Even you, you will see it there. It is not about peace house. It is about God setting a door before you. You will see it there. Please follow me to believe God and just say, Lord, carry me into this. I know you have struggled for years. Stop your struggles and say, Lord... That lady said, don't help a man who is still strong while he's drowning. Allow him to become exhausted. I wish you are saying, Lord, I'm exhausted. 
Carry me, O oh God. Carry me into this. Carry me into what you are about to do now. Carry me into what you are talking about. This door you are speaking about, I will live to walk into it in the name of Jesus. Lord, please carry me. Wherever you are, can you just, can you join us to pray? The matter before you may look so big. It may appear as here, how can anybody surmount it? Stop surmounting it. Just put your hand in the hand of him who is ready to carry you there. Thank you tonight. Thank you. I want you to stretch your hand with me tonight. And I want to tell God, Lord, I believe you. If this matter is ringing in your spirit as it is with me, and you are willing to believe God along with me, the Lord Jesus told that woman, he said, if you had believed, you will have seen the glory of God. Lord, we stretch forth our hand. The little understanding we have has brought us to this place again. We are in, in faith and not in unbelief. We decide to put aside what was our strength. We put aside what is even our own experience. We lay aside our muscles. We decide to hope on your mercy. As you see us, Lord, stretching forth our hand to you. The song I would have wanted to sing is to say nothing in in my hands I bring simply to to the cross I cling naked God to the fortress helpless Lord to the fortress Foul light to the fire, fountain fly, wash me, Savior, oh, I die. One more time. Nothing in, nothing in my hand. Simply. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked God to the evil dream. Helpless, helpless Lord. To the bush I can never see now. Ah, found I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior. Wash me, Savior. Oh, I tell you. Lord, when you spoke about that Cyrus, you said, the man, I upheld his right hand. I have opened a two-leaf gate before him. And I will hold his hand to subdue nations. What looked impossible, you are using a man of no, no experience to confound the mighty. Will you do it, oh God, again with our lives? Will you fulfill the promise that you have made concerning us now? With these open doors that no man can shut, this key that you are placing in our hands. 
Will you, Lord, please look at us? As weak as we are. And go ahead with your work in our days. Will you, O God, according to your promise, make this year, the beginning of this decade, a year of unlimited access to your glory? A year, O God, of open heavens? When things will be happening that cannot be linked with our little self. When you have liberty, oh God, to demonstrate your great power in our little weakness. When none of us will be a hindrance to the extent to which you want to go in the nations. When you said a little one among us, we become a thousand. How will that kind of thing be? Except the mercy of God. Now Lord. Take us out of the way. So that you can have your way. Lord I ask. That thing in us. That looks as if it is strong. And is stopping your work. Can you please dismantle it. So that you can freely. Take the glory for what you want to do in this land. Will you please, Lord, accept these feeble hands, these feeble lives, and through them demonstrate the glory of your power. Such that the excellency of the power might not be of us, but of God. Lord, can I ask you that what you say you are going to do. The open door, the greater task that you have been speaking about. Will you now, Lord, activate it? And for each one of us, activate it. From house to house, from family to family, let this be activated now in the name of Jesus Christ. Each one brother or sister here begin to know the dimension of open doors. Even in their own way. Even before we talk of a global walk. Before we talk about what is going to affect nations of the earth. Even for them, oh God, let there be open doors. Open doors even in their families. Open doors. Access. Unlimited access. Let it be ministered to them from tonight. Let them come back and say, see what the Lord has done. I did nothing, but God did everything. Before I began to say anything, because I didn't even know what to say, the people already melted. Give them that kind of experience, testimonies in the name of Jesus Christ. Those that are pastors here, I pray that the years of their mourning, the years of their struggle, let it come to an end now. Since you brought them here, and they are patient to sit under your instruction. Please, Lord, minister an open door to their lives. Amen. Minister an open door to their ministries. Amen. Let them come to this experience that you have been showing us. Let them know. You said you will even cause those who, t- who taught they are from the synagogue of Satan, they will come and worship at our feet. And you will cause them to know that you have loved us. God, will you do that for these brothers? Will you please do that for these sisters? Will you please do that for these families? In the name of Jesus Christ.
And Lord, while I know you will do it for these individuals, in their various levels, their doors will be opened. Yeah. Even those who are watching us from afar, those who are following these instructions and say, I'm part of that, please cause their heavens to open today. Yeah. Those that have been banging on one door for years, when they will rise from this meeting, they will find that it has already been opened. Yeah. When those sisters were going, they were worried. Who will roll away the stone? Who will roll away the stone? They did not know that the stones have been rolled. Lord, I'm asking now, what their strength could never have done your simple finger will put it out. So Lord, I'm asking that even as they go out of this vision's retreat, they will only be walking to open doors. But all of these open doors is, is only but a beginning of the open doors. Lord, I ask that that which is paramount in your heart is even beyond our personal needs. It's about the kingdom of God. That you want to open doors for us to serve your purpose. Lord, we receive it tonight. Amen. Since you said it is not going to happen because we have grown in strength. Then, Lord, there's nothing else that can stop you from doing it. So, Lord, go ahead and show us your glory in the land of the living. Thank you. And so, Father, for everyone who has experienced stagnation, we release you in the name of Jesus. Say, behold, I set before you an open door which no man can shut. Tonight, Lord, every padlock, let them open of their own accord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as they walk out of here, doors I don't know how to describe to you because it will be in diverse ways. Yeah. Doors of jobs. Yeah. Those, oh God, who have waited for a divine visitation, the door will open unto you. Yeah. Those, oh God, who have waited and said, I've been checking, I've been writing, jam, I've been looking for admission for this is the sixth time. Father, you know they have little strength. But because you have decided to turn your attention, doors will open to them now. Yeah. By the time they begin to come back and say, ah, it has opened, we will only return to give you the praise. Yeah. Father, there are some that they just wonder, what will I do for a living? Let doors be open to their lives now. Yeah. But all these doors is coming so that the glory you are speaking to us about, the visitation that you are talking about, the next greater task that you are talking to us about, it is such that we'll be able to walk into it. Amen. Thank you for hearing us. Is there anybody sick among us who will speak unto your sicknesses? Say, when God shut a door, nobody can open it. We shut up that sickness now. We open door unto your health. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
As simple as we are asking you, Father, we know it's done. There are other things, Lord, we are recognizing that you are going to bring to us access. Access. We receive access tonight. Thank you. Will you please just end this prayer with me? Personally. And say, God, I'm committing myself to you in this matter. I'm making a commitment. I will live to see your glory in the land of the living. Those of you that have been along, tell God I will not turn back. Because I now know that you have not forgotten me. Can you make a fresh commitment to God tonight? And say, Lord, as you see me, I want to walk with you. I want to walk into this. I want to grow into this. I want to move in this. I want to, I want to be part of what you are doing. Lord, I want to believe you for this. It's becoming clear to me, oh God. Ah, thank you, Jesus. If you have only struggled and struggled and struggled, I announce to you that your days of struggle is finished. Said so those who have entered into his rest, they have ceased from their struggles. Lord, I ask that you minister your rest to their heart. Minister your rest to their situation. Minister your rest to their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ.